Okay, the big hand on the NTP client tells me it's time I got going. So, hi folks, I'm Dave. Um, been at AWS for a shade over four years now, helping uh, customers mostly around Europe, Middle East, and Africa address their security and compliance requirements on AWS, and otherwise uh, trying to make a constructive nuisance of myself in my uh, relatively small amount of spare time inventing stuff. Um, so we do have quite a bit of stuff to get through today. I am going to be going at a little bit of a gallop. From an administrative perspective, um, video of this session will be going up on YouTube within a day or so. So uh, no need to take photographs unless you particularly want to. You can go and freeze frame the video as needed. Similarly, the slides are expected to land on SlideShare not very much longer after the video shows up. We are now in the last full day of reInvent, and I suspect your feet are probably as grateful about this as mine are. So there aren't actually that many related breakouts left to do um, pertinent to um, this session, though we have actually had what's effectively a mini track in all all about landing zones. So there are two sessions remaining, uh, one of which actually does overlap a little bit with this one. I don't mind, I, I, w I, I won't take any offense if you choose to sneak out a little bit early so you can go and catch the governance at scale one, as I know that is uh, very interesting. Um, also, um, if you, th this session is in some ways a companion piece to um, the one with session code Sierra Echo Charlie 303, given on Monday and Tuesday by my friend and partner in Geekery, Sam Elmalak. Uh, that's already on YouTube if you want to go look it up. Who was actually in that session or has otherwise seen it? A few, okay. So I, I, I will be sure to uh, try and recap a little bit on the fly. Um, before I actually kick off into this, um, bearing in mind that it is now Thursday and um, Control Tower was announced yesterday, um, obviously that was developed under some secrecy, so we haven't really been able to talk about it before now. The situation is Control Tower has been released in preview. I really wouldn't go put, looking at putting production workloads in it today. Uh, play with it, evaluate it, use it to teach yourself about how it's going to work. Um, but if you actually need a, ref a reference multi-account architecture that is ready for production workloads before the end of this year, then landing zone is probably the thing to go look at. Uh, once um, Control Tower actually does go into general availability, there will be a migration path for your accounts and other assets from landing zone into Control Tower if that's something that you want to do. So just to set the scene as I normally do around compliance, I think of compliance very much as being the outcome of what happens around threat modeling. Once you've actually got your governance framework, particularly in terms of costing and management and so forth, all, all set up at a corporate level, everything starts with a threat model in my view. And threat modeling and risk analysis and assessment is normally done by your risk group if you're of the size of organization large enough to have one. Um, that then normally leads to a bunch of security controls to actually um, mitigate the um, material risks that uh, are considered to be um, appropriate to mitigate rather than being residual risks that, need, that can just be accepted. You then have compliance that sort of has a relatively large overlap with this. In all honesty, I just think of compliance as, be, as being um, dealing with the um, controls laid out as a result of someone else's analysis of their threat model, whether that be your regulator or some, in, or some other industry body. In terms of uh, AWS's compliance with various standards, we've uh, got a few certifications. And um, the way in which this normally works, certainly for things like SOC and PCI and uh, the various ISO standards, is that uh, for SOC and PCI in particular, we actually publish our audit reports via the artifact service. Who is an artifact user? Just a few. Okay, it's a great little self-service portal. Um, there is a click-through NDA on it for actually getting access to the audit reports that we have done 
uh, mostly by ENY certified points, so Ernst & Young in the Netherlands. Uh, we actually get our PCI done by coal fire um, here in the USA, and those audit reports are available along with things like continuation letters, so you can be sure that once a SOC report period is over, we're actually already starting the evaluation for the next one. Um, so there's a lot of information in there about things like our physical security, controls that uh, your auditors or regulators or other industry bodies may want. It's a good read. There's also, if you need to do particular things like PCI compliance, there are also workbooks from um, third-party companies like Anishan in there, which are essentially step-by-step -step, um, approaches and controls to go about um, implementing controls in your AWS environments that are within scope that we expect will give you a relatively straightforward ride with your auditor. Outside of um, Artifact, there's a bunch of frameworks and assets which are also well worth a look. Um, we've uh, got two CIS benchmarks that we, in, con in conjunction with CIS keep, and, and other contributors, keep up to date. They had an update a little earlier this year. Uh, we also have our Enterprise Accelerator assets, which give you frameworks for mapping the controls in a standard to means of implementing them in AWS, and also sets of CloudFormation templates that you can use to essentially baseline environments so that, when, so that um, you can then build your assets on top of them and, again, hopefully get a reasonably straightforward um, audit, um, audit actually set up and through. However, these are at the moment all predicated on single account environments. This is something I'd like to tweak in the future, and this is something I uh, may well get on to um, doing some work on next year. Certainly all of them can benefit from extending with SCPs and some of the other features that we've been announcing. So on to multi-account environments. I'm hoping that you've seen this, all, this, this diagram already. Please raise your hand if you have. Good. So I, I will still give a very brief explanation for the few people who didn't raise their hands, but um, I'm glad most of you have. Your landing zone essentially comprises five core accounts plus a whole bunch more that you then go and configure yourself. So the core accounts are your organization's master, which goes and actually provisions and um, and manages the SCPs in your other accounts and also consolidates your billing. You then have your security account in which you go and put your security monitoring tooling, uh, your automated security remediation tooling, more of which in a moment. And um, essentially, this account also has the ability for people in that account, which should be your security team, to be able to have read access to all the, all the other assets in your environment. You then have your log archive account, which is where all the logs from all your accounts aggregate to in terms of CloudTrail and CloudWatch logs and so forth. All that's in there is an S3 bucket with a bunch of permissions on it from the point of view of all your accounts being able to write to it, but only a select few being able to read. The network account if you, uh, is, is where you can put things like transit way, also where you can um, go putting any Direct Connect links. Um, your network team will probably thank you if you have a Direct Connect environment to actually have um, Direct Connect all come into there so that they can then set up the, their workflow for assigning um, virtual interfaces on the AWS side to 802.1Q VLANs on their side for integration into your corporate network before then offering each VIF out to the account that needs it to plug into the relevant VPC. And shared services is where you can put things like um, corporate directory information, um, any, any um, tooling that you may need to use that is common to um, all your various teams and projects, and that essentially is your core. Um, um, as far as team and group accounts is concerned, this is where you start, start using organizations, organizational units, OUs, very LDAP. And how you actually go about laying those out really comes down to what your um, organization chart and your um, corporate policies look like in terms of whether you want to assign groupings of accounts based on projects in progress or um, assign them to departments 
And also, um, again, this depends on what degree of autonomy apart, uh, departments should have from each other and from any um, core security team. Um, also, um, what secrets Department A may need, may need to keep from Department B. From the point of view of developers, one thing that uh, we often get asked at AWS is how we manage to um, move fast without breaking things. And this is where it's actually good to give your developers a reasonable degree of autonomy. So it's a good idea to actually give each developer their own account on which they are effectively root. So they can go and use this just to learn AWS technologies, to prototype, to debug, to work on side projects that before, that before they actually potentially get adopted into a formal management framework, at which point they then become um, imported into a team and group account environment. So if your developer is writing code that actually needs to have privilege in terms of being able to make AWS API calls itself, they can do that without having to, uh, because, because they have um, dominion over um, I am in their own little account, without having to go to a security manager in their team and say, please, can you um, tweet this uh, role profile for me? Finally, um, down in the bottom right, you've got your own data center or another environment in which you have your central directory um, so that people can authenticate and authorize into roles to go and do things with the AWS APIs in these various accounts. And if we look at this in a little more detail, you can actually do some interesting things here that I'll be talking about just in the next bit. But there's a few further truths hiding in this slightly more detailed diagram. So if you look at the resource accounts in the middle on the far right hand side, you'll see that KMS and potentially Cloud HSM, should you need it, are actually located in the resource accounts rather than in a shared, rather than in a shared service account. There are good reasons to keep the keys that actually are the master keys for encrypting your assets close to and within the same accounts as the assets themselves. Um, so this also um, helps address the question as well as how many accounts do I need, how many KMS master keys do I need? You, you normally just have at least one um, of your own per AWS resource account. Other things that you can do um, in the context of billing, in the organization's master account down in the bottom right, we have an extra Lambda function that actually can migrate billing records, potentially with some anonymization if needed, out to a separate account just left of that one that you can then go and use your governance at scale tooling to do billing analysis on. Um, or indeed, that would be the bucket that you would potentially expose to your finance team and your auditors. In the top at the right hand side, that's where our log bucket lives. Again, this is where you can actually go about um, as well as exposing that to your internal audit team, also potentially exposing that further. But let's look at what's going on on the left here in terms of our federation. I am federation is a good thing to do anyway um, in that it has the useful side effect if you federate at a group to group level, which we recommend, um, of draining personally identifiable information out of IAM. So our usual recommendation is that individual users have no permissions uh, groups that users, are, that users are members of have permission to assume a role, and roles have the relevant least privilege pr permissions to do appropriate and useful things. So if you actually do your federation on a group-to-group -group basis, so when you actually set your SAML up um, in, in IAM, you're just actually, consume, you're just actually consuming and filter on, filtering on O equals, O U equals, and DC equals, then there's no PII in that or le unless you're running a particularly weird schema. Um, now, there are two schools of thought about how to go about doing this federation. We actually recommend doing direct federation from each AWS account to your central IDP. Um, this may sound like a lot of work. In practice, the bulk of the work is actually setting up the IDP in the first place. Federa federation and setting that up to the actual account is sufficiently straightforward that it can actually be automated and landing zone can help you do that. 
Um, the other way of doing it is by having a jump account. So you have an AWS account that uh, federates back to your IDP, and then all your users authenticate into that account, and that's where their cross-account roles live. Um, that's, that will take you so far from the point of view of scalability. The issue happens that your IAM policies, as you start adding roles and uh, multiple cross-account rules and so forth, can get very complicated indeed and very quickly. So if I show my age here, it winds up um, looking a bit like when you get up to sort of 30 accounts or so, it winds up looking a bit like how things used to be where you had um, central checkpoint firewalls for your enterprise running on a couple of really big Nokia boxes and you could get some, you, you, had to wind up, you had to wind up doing interesting dependency analysis if you wanted to introduce a new rule to ensure that it didn't, um, it didn't um, also involve any um, undesirable changes associated with that. So direct federation scales better, also because users aren't going to be authenticating every few seconds it does actually scale very well. You can have a relatively modest set of hardware running your IDP and federate a whole bunch of accounts to it without either lighting the wires up or putting a huge amount of load actually on the IDP itself. So what do you go putting in there? Well, you're only going to have a subset of users in your company, I would expect, unless you're a born-in-the-cloud startup, who are going to be using the AWS APIs. And if we go looking at this in a bit more detail here, so this is what we would typically recommend originally about how to do IAM federation. So you've got your central directory in your corporate data center. You put some extra software on top of it to make it function as a SAML IDP, and you then go um, do SAML federations from it to your various AWS accounts. In practice, I do not know a single customer who does this. Reason being that that central directory has not only got everyone's credentials in it all the way up to your CEO, but it's probably got all sorts of further configuration in there for enterprise software that you're using on premise. There's a whole bunch of stuff which just is not relevant to the use of AWS. So the normal thing to do is stand up a secondary um, directory, which you put your um, IDP um, software on, and then just do a limited LDAP-S replica between the two. So you're just actually synchronizing the details of those groups of users who are going to be using the AWS APIs. So this is what I see a lot of. A lot of people, in fact, most people who do this, also then go putting extra security technologies in between the two so that you can essentially establish a trust gradient between your internal and external, uh, internal and external directories um, to guard against the issue of your external IDP being hacked and then potentially hacked back from to the main corporate directory. Now, here's the thing. We've got an IDP here. We've done that piece of work. We, we've probably built it so in a semi-automated fashion so that if our hardware dies, we can go and replace it very quickly. Why not use that to build two, uh, two IDPs? And I have one for the very, very small number of people who may need in an emergency to interact with our production environment, and then have all our developers and so forth for their sandbox accounts have their details in the non-production IDP. As you may have seen already this week in any DevSecOps sessions you've been to, the ultimate aim on the sort of road towards security nirvana is to get to the point where your production environment shouldn't be touched by human hands. You want to be able to have your code go into some code repository, be built by a continuous integration environment, and then potentially, once it's gone through its appropriate test, uh, automated testing, be deployed by an automated deployment system into your production environment where the, production, where the automated deployment system is the only thing that has the permissions to push things to a live world. So at this point, once we've actually separated our IDPs out, in normal operation, we just turn our production one off. There is a, a design axiom at AWS. It's been um, something that uh, we've cleaved to for a good many years, but um, we haven't really talked about it that much externally until this year, and that is that you want to keep humans away from data. 
Now, my interpretation of that and the little extension on the top is that this means that you also want to keep humans away from APIs because it's by using and fat fingering APIs that humans mess data up. So if your humans in this model do not in normal circumstances have access to the APIs, then they can't go messing with your actual uh, real world data, which should only go existing in your production environment and any backups of it in the first place. Obviously, in the case of emergencies happening or, or strange things being observed, you can do the break glass thing and boot your IDP, ensure that it's synchronized with your central directory, and then go executing API calls. This is very much like what you may already be familiar with in terms of using Bastion hosts in, um, in non-production environments, typically, to get to um, EC2 instances that may be observed to be misbehaving. So again, normally, you only stand these up when an emergency is happening, and you keep it shut down in normal operation. Now, from the point of view of compliance and scoping, the, the magic, well, the magic with compliance is always in the scoping. If there's one thing that's guaranteed to make an auditor nervous, it is not having a hard defined boundary between what's in scope and what isn't. Um, and while a lot of people use VPCs as scope boundaries, there are a number of good reasons why accounts actually make, make better scope boundaries in certain circumstances. Um, anyone here in US healthcare? Just a couple, okay. So if you guys have already signed our HIPAA business associate agreement, you will know from that that it's a, it's a, it's a mandated requirement in there to identify at account level which AWS accounts are handling personal healthcare information. And, and the account boundary is actually your compliance boundary. Um, you'd probably want to go um, in an organization's or landing zone environment to do that account tagging in, the o, in an OU name. But um, I'll also just tell you a little story in a moment about why using accounts rather than VPCs as your boundary may actually be a really good idea. So when you go actually provisioning an account in organizations or, in, or indeed in your landing zone, um, you wind up getting this, this rather long string role, which is effectively your root environment uh, landing zone uses a secondary one, which is the CloudFormation stack set execution role, in which to then, when you provision an account, to go hardening it, configuring it, pre-populating it with certain assets, such as, uh, such as log monitoring and shipping environments. And then it also applies an SCP on the top, which I'll be talking about at uh, some length later. But back to that little story. So I had a, an engagement with a bank, who shall remain nameless here. And they were looking to deploy a PCI DSS compliant workload in AWS. Not an unusual thing to be doing. And they had a very rigorous and diligent, and I think relatively new QSA, so PCI auditor, who came to them and said, okay, so you, you wanna use this, you wanna use VPC as a boundary, fair enough. You're, you've got your EC2 instance here, is here, which are processing card data, and you're running the CloudWatch logs agent on them, so as to go scraping your log files and um, th therefore determine that your applications are performing correctly. Now, I'm gonna give you a what if. What if one of your instances was to misbehave for whatever reason, such that the card data it's processing found its way into one of those log files that's being scraped. All of a sudden, so you're running the CloudWatch logs agent, it's behaving like a remote syslog, you're shipping your data out of your VPC into the AWS logging system. This is an escape vector for card data. Tell me what secondary and compensating controls you've got to stop this happening and alert on it should the occasion arise. And the bank went, um. Come here, Dave, need a hand here. So, they got me involved, and bearing in mind they were actually mid-audit cycle um, on this PCI workload, they had a fairly tight time scale. 
we did something creative and hackish involving SE Linux on their instances so that uh, card data couldn't actually make its way into those files and, and that, that control satisfied the QSA. But we decided um, afterwards that there really had to be a better way of doing it. And this is what we came up with. So let's actually look at how you can go filtering your logs. We've got an account here. We've got CloudTrail and Config going into an S3 bucket the way they normally do. And we've also got an instance or a set of instances running the CloudWatch logs agent, so log data goes into CloudWatch. We can trigger a Lambda function off of that so that we can then get those logs into an S3 bucket. And this doesn't stop us also using CloudWatch events to have a number of other Lambda autoresponders doing things to respond to other events as needed. So what we can do is rather than take our log data and then just use, cloud, use CloudTrail cross account or the, um, or the config aggregator to ship data into our central logging account, let's put another Lambda function in the way, which not only does our shipping here, but also scans our code and redacts anything it finds that shouldn't be in there. Um, for card data, it's relatively straightforward to just do a regex grep for it because card data is of a reasonable size, it's of a, it's a, it's a well-known format, it's got a well-known checksum on it. You could actually do this instead with two Lambda functions because one of, our, one of our recommendations around Lambda is to have one function and one purpose and indeed one IAM role. So you could have your first Lambda function there in the signal path just do your um, detection and redaction of anything that um, is looking untoward and uh, post, uh, post an alert to an SNS topic being watched by your security team in the event of such data being observed. And then your second Lambda function just goes and does your shipping to your remote bucket. This also gives you the opportunity, if you want to, to verify that your redaction is working correctly in the account where it's happening just by looking at differences between your two log buckets. You could even put something like an iCar in there so that your redaction, log, uh, your redaction lambda function will redact another kind of data that actually isn't sensitive. In terms of how such a function would work, we've got a prototype for doing this for CloudTrail. We want to get it into GitHub, but uh, it's taking us a little longer than we, uh, than we thought. A friend of mine wrote this, and we're just having a bit of fun engaging with, the, with, our, with our posting process. But it's not a complicated thing to do. And of course, this would uh, satisfy our, our bank's QSA in this context very much so as well. Um, it also doesn't need that much in the way of IAM roles, uh, I, I am role permissions to go and do its job. So as I said, I'm hoping that it won't be that much longer before we can get some um, sample code for this up on our AWS samples account on GitHub. A thing that landing zones don't really talk about that much at the moment is cross-region access or indeed how to go about laying them out in a multi-region context. I would normally suggest, certainly if you're dealing with sensitive data uh, where potentially compliance requirements may differ between um, different countries, it's worth maybe even looking at deploying a landing zone per region. I know a lot of people um, like to ship their logs um, around the world so that everything aggregates into one bucket. Uh, you can do that as well if you wind up actually doing, doing redaction again on, for example, PII, because we all know that there's legislation out there where certain places take a dim view of PII leaving geographical boundaries. So how to go about doing this? First of all, there's obvious reasons to do it. We actually introduced a capability earlier this year that makes it a lot easier than it used to be. So the magic rune to look at is AWS colon requested region. And I've got a little sample bit of IAM policy here that um, allows you to restrict any uh, launching or manipulation of EC2 to US regions only. This works just fine. If you want to go restricting to regions that are non-American, um, there's an extra little bit of wrinkle in that you wouldn't necessarily want to apply this to all services. 
since the last I looked, if you actually um, block access to US East 1 for IAM, then IAM being a global service, your IAM calls stop working. Um, similarly, you wouldn't want to do it for organizations um, or for CloudTrail. Um, Route 53, you can actually still use Ireland if you, if you block US East, that does still work. Also, um, just to prove that not all, not all innovation happens at AWS, I found this neat little CloudFormation script on GitHub, which will act as a canary to determine if there's any activity in any regions that you don't want to see, you don't want to have assets stood up in. So we've got a preventive control, we've got a detective control, we've got some nice defense in depth going on here. Um, until guard duty launched, we actually also recommended that you stand up a bucket in every region that you didn't want to use and turn CloudTrail on, and indeed did, did, did the um, cross-region um, log shipping thing using CloudTrail's intrinsic capability. Um, we did a bit of a tour around some UK customers early, uh, right at the start of this year, and we found that they're actually now preferring to use guard duty as this canary of choice for activity in regions that you um, don't want to do stuff in. So this is um, also worth looking at. I mentioned auditors earlier. So we've got all our logs aggregating in our bucket in the top right. We want to be able to write to those logs from everywhere in our organization, but we want to be careful as to who's able to read those as well as our security team. If you're a regulated entity, you're going to have an internal audit group as well. Give them read access to it so that they can then do their, their analytics on it and ensure that they are comfortable in the dress rehearsal for your audits, that everything is going to be sensible. Um, the roles that they're going to need to do that, again, aren't complicated. There's a managed IAM role for um, a, a global read. To be honest, it's worth just, pull, just pulling the actions out of that and reusing them, um, as well as obviously giving read access to um, the log bucket. If you have your external auditor also have an AWS account, um, I'd be surprised if they didn't these days, then you can actually do very much the same thing for them. Give them carefully mediated read access just to your log bucket rather than necessarily giving them read access everywhere, um, so that they can actually um, look at your disposition of assets and your admin activities before they come on site and examine your documentation and interview your personnel about your security ops. So this can actually make an audit less disruptive, it's fair to say, because they can actually do the technical aspect from the point of view of examining the technology um, of their audit completely remotely. They don't need to come on site at all. They just need to be sure initially that you've got your bucket and your logging set up the way they like it, because of course any changes in that would then be caught in the logging bucket. Obviously in this case there is a further slight difference in that you would want to um, share your um, access to your bucket but you wouldn't want your auditor's account to be in your organization. Since you're already going to be paying them plenty enough to be auditing you, you don't necessarily want to have their bill from their account roll up into your bill so that you wind up paying for the audit tools that they're using. Finally, if you want to take this to its logical conclusion, nothing stops you giving exactly the same access to your industry regulator. Now, We've had a chat with a number of regulators about this. They think it's a really interesting idea. They aren't all geared up to be able to do this from the point of view of scale yet, but it's something that they could potentially do and find useful. Obviously, they would need a fairly sizable infrastructure to do this if they're, um, if they're ingesting log data from all the entities in the industry that they're regulating but it can be scaled, you can, you can put, um, you, you can put um, kinesis cues in the way as needed and essentially deal with it. When it comes to actually doing auto response, you've probably all seen a few things over the years. So um, there's a popular diagram where essentially you have a couple of flows here. Um, people make calls to endpoints, 
These generate records in CloudTrail, which go in a bucket, but they also wind up triggering CloudWatch events that can trigger Lambda functions, that can then either do stuff um, using, um, using IAM roles um, in terms of automated remediation, or if um, the thing that has been found is sufficiently subtle and complicated that a human needs to be put in the loop, they can go and post the details of um, what the event is to an SNS topic that your security team are watching. If you collapse that down a bit more, you can look at it in terms of someone who has access to APIs, may not actually be that confident or capable with them, um, actually making API calls, those triggering events, and those triggering Lambda responders. Now, our friends at Capital One have gone and put a nice framework together around this called Cloud Custodian. Anyone in here using it? Just a couple. It's worth a look. Even if you don't want to run the whole framework, if you want to look at being able to do automated response, it's a great source of pre-built Lambda functions that you just um, maybe need to tweak a little bit. In addition to actually um, humans generating events, Guard Duty does so too. So Guard Duty outputs CloudWatch events when it, has, uh, when it actually makes a finding. Who here is using Guard Duty? Right, I would hope by the end of the week that's everybody. Um, turning it on is very much a no-brainer. Um, you get a 30-day free trial, and it says over the course of that 30 days how much it would be charging you if it was charging you. Um, but in terms of the threat intelligence you can get out of it, if you cleave to Lockheed Martin's cyber kill chain model, there's a whole bunch of useful and subtle stuff that it can trap on. And in terms of how those further get categorized, I would definitely look at the full list up at the top right there. Um, the Guard Duty team are always adding new findings, so pretty much any list in any presentation is out of date unless it's one of the Guard Duty team that's giving it. That list at the top right is the definitive one. And how they normally set these things up is Guard Duty generates an event that goes into CloudWatch. You'd use CloudWatch alarms to match on a rule and then you go and do stuff. We have a Lambda function in our AWS samples account on GitHub that will pick up guard duty findings, and based on the severity that guard duty assigns them, it can either it can post them to a number of places. Um, typically, people send low severity findings to a Slack noise channel that's just there for logging stuff. Uh, medium severity stuff goes to a Slack channel that the admins are actually paid to keep an eye on and anything high severity can go to somewhere like PagerDuty to get people out of bed if needed. If you go looking at the actual anatomy of a CloudWatch event, this is an example here, and really the interesting things happen in the latter half of it. So we can see that Bob, our hapless intern, so we have attribution on the event here, which um, config rules doesn't give you, um, has tried stopping CloudTrail running in US East, and he tried doing that with the given access key, and he executed that call from signin.amazonaws.com, which is the AWS console, rather than one of his IP addresses on, let's say, his laptop. So we can trap on all this and actually do useful stuff with it. And we've, I've got a nice example here from a couple of friends of mine and a couple of reinvents ago. It's still perfectly valid, it still works well, so it's, it's actually my preferred example to give. So here's Bob an EC2 instance. Um, in, in order to do so, we need to know what the AMI is that the instance is being launched from. We have a subnet ID as to, where, as to what network it's being attached to. We have, a, we have security group IDs, because you have to in terms of actually putting those on your, um, on, on your ENIs. That will go, uh, we can trap that with a CloudWatch event and then actually trigger a Lambda function off of that to see if that combination of things is approved or not. Um, we don't want to actually go hardwiring our policy into our Lambda function, especially since it's probably going to change on a fairly regular basis as we, as we update our AMIs. So policy would naturally reside in something like DynamoDB, and we can express our policy as tuples of all the allowed combinations that we have. So is Bob's combination one that we're happy with? We can actually see what he's gone and stood up, and no, it isn't. 
So at this point, we can kick off another event that kicks off another Lambda function that goes and kills Bob's instance. Now, obviously, we have a race condition going on here. Since Bob started his instance, and we want this whole cycle to complete before that instance actually goes binding listeners to ports and doing things it shouldn't be. In practice, it takes a minute, maybe two, to stand up even a minimal um, Linux-based EC2 instance, and it takes less than that for the cycle that we've got on screen to complete. So we are going to win, and Bob's instance is never actually going to spring fully into life. Now, a quest this is all fair enough. The question then comes for pretty much any security technology you may want to deploy, how do you go about doing this multi-account? Really, you've got two options. You can either treat a multi-account environment as a collection of single account env environments and just replicate, excuse me, just um, replicate what you already do across multiple accounts. There are good and bad reasons as to why you might, might, might want to do this and that you still need to manage the whole environment in each account. Of course, if you've got different accounts for different purposes, that may actually be a good thing to do. Alternatively, you can split the um, environment into two so that you have your detectors in your individual accounts and you centralize your responders. Um, so obviously this gives you less management overhead, but it means that everything has to be beholden to relatively common policy. This is probably, probably easier to understand graphically. So if we have account one here with stuff in it, we just go putting the same thing in account two. Uh, whereas if we have option two, we actually go and use things like the CloudWatch events bus and cross account roles on, um, on our Lambda functions in order to centralize our detection, uh, our, our propagation of actions, our detection and response. Now, something that uh, some friends of mine in AWS professional services have done, uh, which um, they only got going sufficiently recently that it hasn't made it onto anybody's slides that I'm aware of, is they've actually gone and built a reference architecture for this that has some guard duty responders and a whole bunch of other useful Lambda functions in it. It's called Aero, as in the chocolate bar, and um, they're, they're exhibiting it in the quad at the Aria in the Builder's Fair. So if the Builder's Fair is still open, please go along and have a look at this. They should be demoing it. Now we get on to what is probably my favorite bit. Full disclosure, I spent a lot of time working at Sun Microsystems a bunch of years ago, and about half that time, probably about five years worth, I was doing interesting stuff for interesting people in UK government involving multi-level cross-domain stuff on trusted Solaris. Mandatory access control, when you get your head around it, it sort of works your way into your head and stays there. So if you, if, if, for those of you who are old enough to remember the MITRE compartmented mode workstation spec that uh, trusted Solaris and other things like HP Virtual Vault came from, um, I probably run a compartmented mode Cortex these days. And um, I actually think that mandatory access control and multi-level cross-domain environments have definite use in certain very carefully scoped contexts. Organizations actually enables you to do mandatory access control in AWS. The first actual feature for mandatory access control was Glacier Vault Lock that came out a couple of years ago. As you may have seen from earlier this week, we now have S3 Object Lock, which I'm very happy to talk about now. And you may want to actually use Object Lock on um, some of the, ob on, on the objects in your, on, in your consolidated logging bucket as well to make sure that the logs can't be tampered with. So with organizations, you create groups of accounts um, you can actually nest these up to five deep, and then you use organizations to attach service control policies. So service control policies, what they are and what they do. They are very much like IAM policies, but at this particular point in time, there's a couple of things that are, they aren't able to do. They don't support conditions, and they don't support fine-grained resources. So your resource field needs to be a star. But you can set them up to whitelist or blacklist, when I write them, I'm always blacklisting, and they effectively act 
as an invisible prepend on the front of the IAM policy in the account that the in, in the account in your organization that the SCP is being applied to. This is the neat thing. Root is actually in scope to be affected by SCPs. So SCPs are invisible to anyone in the child account, including root. They're immutable and they're applied to all users. So it looks like system policy in an old school B1 mandatory access control environment. Any SE Linux jockeys in the audience or, or trusted BSD, uh, one or two, okay. But um, I think mandatory access control is a really, really good thing for highly secure systems, but it can be fun to manage. Um, once you've actually built an old school system or, or something like SE Linux, if you want to change your system policy, you have to completely rebuild the system. There's no other way around it. With SCPs, while you still have mandatory access control from the point of view of the account the SCP has been applied to, you can actually do further things where the SCP can be revoked in the event of there needing to be a, a, a pre-approved change. So I'll get onto that in just a moment. Most people also think about applying SCPs when an account gets created to prevent services that you don't want to use being used. And indeed, this is the, t this is the view that Landing Zone takes at the moment. That's actually half the story. You can go standing up assets in your accounts and then apply an SCP after the fact in order to make them immutable. How would you, for example, like the idea of having Lambda functions that are execute only? We've already seen how you can um, use Lambda functions for doing log redaction and also for doing auto response. If those, if those Lambda functions, especially in a log redaction context, are in your developer sandbox account, you don't want your developer, even if they're rooting that sandbox account, to go messing up the operation of your Lambda function. So put an SCP on it. That can actually stop them uh, doing that, unless, of course, their job happens to be writing Lambda functions. So most people just use SCPs like this um, to disable services. A very common baseline which um, Landing Zone also uses is to stop logging being disabled. So you've got a little SCP here to stop CloudTrail being disabled. You can do the same thing for CloudWatch and VPC flow logs and config. One thing um, that actually S3 object lock um, interacts with in interesting ways, it doesn't quite obsolete it is one to make the existence of an S3 bucket and the policy applied to it immutable. Um, so you could actually make objects in S3 immutable as well if you were to put, uh, if you were to um, have S3 delete object in that list there. Um, putting S3 put object in there could be done as well if you want to have the most static of static websites served out of your S3 bucket, but then you wouldn't be able to append things either. If you had versioning on your bucket, then you still wouldn't, then you could actually deal with this, as, you, you could deal with this that way. I've already mentioned making Lambda functions immutable. You can do that with this, which still allows you to go and call your Lambda functions, plus read information about their status and their versioning and so forth. Also, a thing I see in a couple of banks, so, I, I know a few investment banks who do lots of big financial calculations, HPC stuff in AWS environments, and they want to ensure that uh, these calculations, which of course inform their market position, stay really, really, really confidential. The way they do this, I think, is actually really rather neat. Um, they've got an account with a VPC in it and a really big EC2 compute farm but they don't actually have an internet gateway or a VGW or Direct Connect coming into that environment. They just have an S3 bucket with a VPC private endpoint. So they put their data in the S3 bucket and then they use systems manager run command to go and kick off the batch job to do their HPC calculations. The, the script that they call with run command does the calculations, puts the results back in the bucket, 
at which point, at, at which point they, the, the instances then quiesce themselves. So they're, they're able to do their command and control using Systems Manager with no direct internet connection. I think that's kind of cool. And you can use this to stop internet gateways being put on your VPCs or indeed having your VPCs peer to other VPCs that may have internet gateways on them because you want to close off that option as well. In terms of what to put in an SCP and what to put in IAM, obviously, as I said, I, um, SCPs right now, there are certain things they don't do. If you want to do hard enforcement, certainly in a production environment of um, ensuring that assets can't be deployed outside of a given region using AWS requested region, as we discussed earlier, there is a way around this, however. You could actually set up your IAM policy with that condition in it and then use an SCP to make your IAM policy immutable. So there are ways and means. Um, SCPs are a little bit of a blunt instrument still, but sometimes a big hammer is what's needed on permissions. Um, so in terms of how to actually go about applying this, I like to think of it in terms of a multi-stage approach. Landing zone actually just does the um, first one at the moment um, in terms of it, uh, it doesn't quite deal with the uh, immutability SCPs yet, but um, it's something I'm talking to the uh, landing zone builders team about. As I mentioned earlier, um, you do have mandatory access control, but there is still the ability to revoke the SCP provided you're an appropriately permissioned entity in the organization's master. So you need to have the permissions, you, you, you need to be able to have the same kind of degree of privilege that was used to put the SCP on in the first place. And what this means is that if you need to make a legitimate change, the owner of the account, and therefore the IAM policy, and the owner of the control to apply and unapply the SCP need to work together. So if you have a requirement in your human policy for doing two-person rules, you now have the means of implementing a technical control to give you one as well. A little bit about third-party tooling. There's a whole number of popular security tools in the AWS marketplace which do various security and compliance checking in, a, in an AWS account. Your mileage may vary, well, plus of course there's things like Cloud Custodian for doing this um, in, uh, as uh, open source. Your mileage may vary when it comes to getting these tools working in a multi-account environment. When it comes to initial tool selection, who here has come across this rather neat thing in terms of the marketplace regulatory model mapper from Allgress? Nobody. This is interesting. Go have, a look, go have a look on it on the marketplace. If my memory serves correctly, it's free to use. But what you can actually do with it is you can set it up with the compliance frameworks that you need to meet, and it'll give you this uh, little pinwheel eye chart here with, uh, that, with the standard involved, breaking it down into sections on the inner wheel, and then on the outer wheel, giving you all the individual controls. Click on one of the individual controls, and it will take you to AWS Marketplace products that implement that control and you can even go buying them straight out of it as well, but it gives you the options as to, as to what you might want to look at for implementing a particular control, and then you can apply these checks to the tools that are available. So in terms of how your tool is going to work, some tools just do log, an log analysis, at which point you can give them access to your centralized logging bucket, and they can determine what the disp disposition of your assets are and to make their findings straight from that. Some of the tools need a read-only role. You'd want to verify with the vendor that it works with cross-account roles. Normally, they do. Any vendors in the room? Hands up, please, on Marketplace. Not this time. OK. Um, I, have, um, I have asked the vendors very nicely if um, they will actually make it clear in their product descriptions on the marketplace 
about the um, multi-account awareness of their products, and some are taking it to heart and doing so. Um, but otherwise, you just wind up um, creating a cross-account role with the same permissions as your audit role. Uh, once your tool has actually done its work, it needs to report. If it's posting um, information to an SNS topic, that should work just fine. You shouldn't actually need to change anything. And for CloudWatch events, if it sends um, findings through that, then you can actually get it to use the CloudWatch events bus. Again, just verify with the vendor that it can. So just to wrap up, a few resources, um, various papers and blogs and online documentation. Um, in terms of governance at scale, which I mentioned earlier, they do have a uh, paper that came out earlier this year, which is uh, worth a read regarding what their take on governance is. It can apply very nicely to a multi-account environment and the usual set of videos that, we, uh, rec that are recommended watching for um, general security, general AWS security education. So I haven't quite come in in terms of wrapping up quickly enough for you to be able to get to um, the governance at scale session. You will have missed the first few minutes of it. If you want to dash there, that's, as I said, um, that's probably a good thing to do. Um, there is a deep dive tomorrow, but that's me. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions afterwards.